Hello, ECC. Welcome to Sunday morning service. My name is Dylan, and I go to Living Water Harbor Small Group. And now that the weather is getting nicer, I'm planning on going on some more walks just to enjoy the nature. I hope you've been able to enjoy the weather as well. Thank you for joining us today, and please prepare your hearts for worship. Good morning. Welcome to English service this morning. If you're new or the first time joining us, we welcome you. Though we could not greet you in person, we hope you would find God speaking and the presence of the Holy Spirit while you're worshiping with us this morning. It is another beautiful morning. We had a few beautiful days in the last few weeks, few, few, few days, and more sunny days will come as we enter into spring this coming weekend. Regardless of rain or sunshine, it is indeed a new day, and it is a new beginning for God's mercy. We've been in this uh, new normal for a little while, more than a year now. We have passed through spring, summer, fall, and winter, all four seasons. This reminds me a stanza in the hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Summer and winter, and springtime and harvest. Sun, moon, stars, in the courses above. Join with all nature in manifold witness to thy faithfulness, mercy, and love. Let us be reminded by God's word this morning from Lamentation 3, verses 22 to 26. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait for him. The Lord is good to those whose hope is in him. To the one who seeks him, it is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Let us pray and prepare our hearts for the service and to hear him this morning. Father God, we thank you again for this morning that we can come together as a church to worship you, to praise you, and to hear your speaking to us. Father, indeed, we thank you for your faithfulness. Every morning as we wake up, every week as we begin a new week, Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness. Because of your new mercy, we have not been consumed. We pray this morning, your Holy Spirit, to be with us. And Lord, it may the word of our mouth and the meditation of our heart be well-pleasing to you. May you also speak to us that we can be doer of your word. And thank you, Father. We pray for your presence. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Um, I invite you to stand with me if you're able um, and join me in worship this morning.
singing again. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, yes, we worship you. We sing to you this morning, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. What a holy and majestic God you are. But at the same time, Lord, through your Son, Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, we could call you Abba, Father. We could come into your presence. We can have an intimate relationship with you. We are so blessed. The salvation that has been made through your son, Jesus Christ. We give thanks to you. We give praise to you. Heavenly Father, we want to say thank you for the gift of technology and the help of our brothers and sisters on the PA team. That while we cannot worship in person, we can still worship online in one spirit. We pray for those who are affected by the pandemic not just physically, but emotionally. Lord, you know us. You know our challenges, spoken and unspoken, you know. Lord, may you comfort us. May you lift us up. May you grant us hope that we would not live in despair, but that we would be filled with your joy and with your peace. Lord, we're grateful for the vaccines that are made available we pray that they could quickly be distributed, especially to the most vulnerable. We pray that the vaccines would be effective so that things can be restored and that people can get back on their feet. But most of all, we pray that you would keep us reliant on you because you are the Lord of the universe. You are the God of all. You are the powerful one, more powerful than anything that we have experienced. And, and you are all knowing that even though we don't know the future, what the future holds, we, we know you, we have you in our lives, the one who holds the future. So Lord, we, as we come before you today in worship of you, remind us just how powerful and how sovereign you are. How, how you long for us to see that and to worship you. You are the source of our hope. You are our rock and our fortress. You are our savior. You are our deliverer. Help us to focus our eyes on you always. And now we pray the prayer that Jesus, you have taught your disciples to pray. Our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Thank you, Auntie Kin Fan, for the offering of the song. This is an announcement time. We just want to let you know that this year we continue to have the virtual VBS. The difference is that we'll be doing it on five Sundays, and you can see all the details on the screen or in the church bulletin. If you can volunteer to help out, please contact uh, uh, Evelyn Chang. The next announcement is uh, this coming two, in about two weeks, that will be a Good Friday service. We just want, to save, want you to save your date, and right after the Good Friday service on Sunday, we will have an Easter Sunday service. Uh, we also have a time together after the Easter service Sunday that we will be gathering together with the Zoom meetings, and we have a very exciting time for you to do some Easter egg decorating. And we have a contest, and you will announce uh, the winner of the contest later. Immediately after uh, service, we'll have Sunday school for various groups, uh, for adults at 1050, 10.50, and for children this afternoon, and also at 11 o'clock, and also for youth, the Sunday school will begin at 11.10. So that's the announcements. And I also want to highlight, if you have any offering, you can either mail a check to the church or go through different electronic fund transfer. We thank you. We thus prepare our heart for the, to receive the message. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. May God's peace be with you. Here on Sundays, we continue to look at the topic of maturity, growing in maturity. You know, maturity is the work of God's Spirit in our lives. And as we continue to submit to God, dwelling in His Spirit, following His leadings, we bear the fruit of maturity. And today we're looking at a chapter in David's life where he exercised incredible, tremendous self-control. Self-control, you know, that's difficult to do. Speaking of self-control, my friends, is there an area in your life where you need self-control? Like this. <clears throat> Here's a lady devouring all kinds of food and digging into, seems like, a tub of ice cream. You know, some of us have done that before. And the caption says, Sometimes I eat things just to avoid the temptation of eating them later, and that's why I'm eating all these things. You know, but that, not just temptation with food, right? Temptation in thought life, temptation with anger and resentment, temptation over gaming, uh, social media. All of us, all of us, we need self-control. I like this definition of self-control. Choosing to do what is right when you feel like doing what is wrong. Knowing that you can, but decide that you won't. Isn't that good? And that's what we all need, self-control. God has a message for all of us today. So with that in mind, let's look at today's passage. 1 Samuel chapter 24 and 1 Samuel chapter 26. Joshua and Jolina will be our scripture readers for today. 1 Samuel chapter 24 verses 1 through 7. When Saul returned from following the Philistines, he was told, Behold, David is in the wilderness of Engedi. Then Saul took 3,000 men chosen out of all of Israel and went to seek David and his men and from the wild goats rocks and he came to the sheepfolds by the way where there was a cave and Saul went to relieve himself now David and his men were sitting in the innermost parts of the cave and David said to him here is the day of which the Lord has said to you behold I will give you your enemy into your hand and you shall do to him as it seems good to do to you. Then David arose and stealthily cut off a corner of Saul's robe. And afterwards, David's heart struck him, 
because he had cut off a corner of Saul's robe. He said to his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my Lord. The Lord's anointed to put his, my, out my hand against him, seeing he is the Lord's anointed. So David persuaded his men with these words, and did not permit them to attack Saul. And Saul rose up and left the cave, and were on his way. 1 Samuel 26, verses 6 through 11. Then David said to Ahimelech the Hittite, and to Joe his brother Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, Who will go down with me into the camp to Saul? And Abishai said, I will go down with you. So David and Abishai went to the army by night. And there lay Saul sleeping within the encampment, with his spear stuck in the ground at his head, and Abner and the army lay around him. Then Abishai said to David, God has given your enemy into your hand this day. Now please let me pin him to the earth with one stroke of the spear, and I will not strike him twice. But David said to Abishai, Do not destroy him, for he can put out his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless. And David said, As the Lord lives, the Lord will strike him, or his day will come to die, or he will go down into battle and perish. The Lord forbid that I should put out my hand against the Lord's anointed. But take now the spear that is at his head and the jar of water, and let us go. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for your word. Um, I pray that you will encounter us this morning and um, help us grow close to you through the word. Um, I pray that we will be able to take something away from Pastor Solomon's message today and that we will be able to apply it to our lives. Um, Yeah. Um, In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Joshua. Thank you, Jolina, for reading God's word for us today. Here's the outline for today's message. A spirit-led individual waits for God's kingdom, trusts in God's sovereignty, and loves one's enemy. Let's look at the first, waiting for God's kingdom. Let me give you a background here of today's passage. Our stories took place while David was waiting, waiting for his kingship to take place. Now, we all know the story. See, back when David was younger, back in 1 Samuel chapter 16, the prophet Samuel prophesied over him. Remember, when he was chosen, Samuel said in front of uh, David's father, Jesse, and all his brothers, man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. And David, as well as everyone around him, knew that one day he would be king of Israel, that one day he would inherit the kingdom. But that one day was years and years later, and David had to wait. And those were difficult years in David's life. While David had been promised that he would be king over Israel, David spent years Many years in the desert, running for his life, hiding in caves, running from King Saul, who had rallied some 3,000 elite soldiers, these trained assassins, to hunt him down. See, David must be so tired. Think about that. Years and years in the desert. So tired of that dry desert air. The heat during the day, the cold in the night, the dreaded lifestyle of a fugitive, someone who had no home to go back to. Would you agree with me that it's very difficult, very difficult to wait when things are hard? Today, the passage that we read tells us that David, the opportunity had come. Him. It seemed as if there was an open door for David to take matters into your own hand, in his own hands and simply just end his suffering. Verse 3, it tells us here that Saul went into the cave to relieve himself, that, that same cave that David and his man were sitting in. This is where my imagination goes wild. 
I mean, King David, I mean, King Saul had to relieve himself. I mean, when you have to go, you have to go. But he went into the same cave where David and his men were hiding. Now, I could picture David's lookout, his, his, um, his watchman, signaling right, to, to his, um, the rest of the troops, right? I see King, King Saul taking off his pants, uh, I, I, uh, going number two, David, this is perfect timing for you to kill him, right? I, I could just see all that going on, and, 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 and here's David's man. The Bible says, they say, here's the day of which the Lord has given to you. They're singing, they're whispering to David, and this is the day, this is the day that the Lord has, they're, they're, they're encouraging him on. They said, David, this is the time for you to do it. God has handed King Saul over you into your hands with all that encouragement. David rose up. What does the Bible said? David rose up and what? What did he do? What did he do? He cut off a corner of Saul's robe. Wait, wait, hold, hold on, hold on here. What, what's going on? Why did David do that? What is the significance of Cutting someone's robe off. I mean, was there an incident in the Bible where it involved something just like this? Yes. Let's be reminded of a few chapters later. First Samuel chapter 15, where Samuel pronounced judgment over Saul. That his kingdom will be taken away from him, remember? And as Saul walked uh, Samuel was walking away from Saul and, and Saul trying to hold him back and trying to hang on to him and ended up tearing a piece of Samuel's robe. And Samuel said to him, this is exactly what's going to happen to your kingdom. God is tearing it away from you. See, the 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 tearing, the cutting of one's robe is a symbol of the kingdom being transferred from one person to the other. Now, could this cutting, this act, this act of cutting Saul's robe, could it be a powerful reminder from God to Saul and to David that the kingdom would be transferred and that it was God who would orchestrate this event. David made a conscious decision to wait, to not take matters into his own hands, but to wait for God's timing. And this was also supported by the fact that David kept referring to Saul as God's anointed. Right? He said to his man, The Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, or lay my hand on him, for he is the Lord's anointed. In fact, seven times, seven times in these two passages, seven times David referred to King Saul as the Lord's anointed. See, he had in mind that it was God who anointed Saul to be king of Israel, and that it was God who gave him, King Saul, the kingdom. See, David was very aware of God's involvement over this whole thing, and he was able to exercise the discipline of waiting, waiting, self-control, waiting for God's kingdom. You know, David's example points us beautifully to Jesus Christ. Because Jesus was often tempted to wait, to not take things uh, to take into his own hands and not to take the shortcut, to not give in to his own desires. Now think about it. When Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, 
Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. He said to him, I will give you all of these things if you will simply bow down and worship me. See, Satan was offering Jesus a shortcut. Shortcut to the kingdom. See, you don't have to follow God. You don't have to obey God. You don't need to suffer. I will simply give it to you right now. Shortcut. If you would simply do what I tell you to do. Jesus said, what did he say? Go away, Satan. Get lost. Get out of here. Thank you, but no thank you. Jesus chose to wait for God's kingdom. And the Bible tells us Satan departed from Jesus until an opportune time. Wow. One of those opportune times came up in Matthew chapter 16. When Peter made that great confession, Jesus, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus says, don't tell anyone. Don't tell anyone. For from that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and he must suffer many things, including dying on the cross. And what did Peter say? That is not going to, that that will never happen to you. But what did Jesus say? He turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. Have you noticed that? Same language as earlier. Get behind me. Get lost. For you have in mind the things of man, not the things of God. See, again and again, Satan wanted Jesus to skip the cross, to not have to suffer. And Jesus says, thank you, but no thank you. Jesus chose the ways of God's kingdom. My friends, and we all tempted every day in every way, as we journey through this life, looming around every corner is the temptation of the shortcut. The shortcut to power, the shortcut to glory, the shortcut to uh, renown, the, the shortcut, to, shortcut to comfort, the shortcut to happiness, the shortcut to joy, you name it. For example, in a dating In a dating relationship, one can take shortcuts. Instead of allowing the relationship to go through the process of of the testing of time, right? The process of, of, of the blessing of parents, of the process of the confirmation of the community. It is so tempting to just take the shortcut to skip all that process, to go from one to 100 and miss out on the, the, a lifetime, even though you get what you want right now, but you miss out on a lifetime of, of that affirmation and that confirmation of God and the blessing of the community. People who cheat on uh, tests, exams, income tax, Um, uh, parents who bribe their kids instead of standing firm and disciplining them. See, those are all examples of shortcuts that we take in our lives. But God wants to remind us today, don't take shortcuts. Choose the way of the cross, submission and obedience, because that's God's plan for us. That's the way to glory. And what a perfect reminder for all of us during this time of Lent where we are to remember our Lord Jesus Christ, our perfect example, how Jesus was a suffering servant, how he took no shortcuts, but he obeyed and he submitted before God the Father. And may we learn from Jesus as well. Amen. Number two, a person led by the Spirit trusts in God's sovereignty. When David could have 
taken things into his own hands. When he could have killed Saul on the spot, he said this, verse 12. May the Lord judge between me and you. May the Lord avenge me against you, but my hand shall not be against you. And later in chapter 26, verses 10 to 11. As the Lord lives, the Lord will strike him, or this day will come to die, or, or his day will come to die, or he will go down into battle and perish. The Lord forbid that I should put out my hand against the Lord's anointing. See, what's David doing? In the midst of a, a temptation where he could have killed Saul, he was acknowledging that God reigned, that God was the ultimate ruler, ultimate judge, and that he is turning justice over to God. It would have been so easy for, for David to kill Saul that day. And I was thinking about this, how David, the act of cutting of a piece of Saul's robe. You know, I don't know about you, but I love watching those knife commercials. I, I love to watch the, their demonstrations, how I remember watching this many years ago, that commercial of the knife slicing through tomatoes. <laughs> loaf, loaf of bread, even a piece of paper, even a pineapple. And, and I was like, you know, next thing I knew, I was on the phone. I was calling them. I was giving them my credit card numbers. I was, I mean, I was placing that order for that, that set of Miracle Blade. And I was thinking as I was reading today's passage, what kind of Miracle Blade did David have? I mean, what kind of miracle blade did he have to cut off a piece of Saul's robe while Saul was going to the bathroom without him even noticing it? I mean, what, how sharp did that knife have to be to cut off the king's robe, you know, that thick velvety stuff, you know, that, that without King Saul noticing it? I mean, what kind of knife was that? I want one of those. I mean, that knife could have been... In Saul's neck. That knife could have severed Saul's head from his body. But no, David exercised restraint. David exercised self control. Why? Because he believed in his heart of hearts that God was sovereign, that God was in control, that this. This is God's business. And he entrusted that power and that authority over to God. And he, and he chose to let God be the judge. He chose to let God settle the score. Boy, all of us are so tempted to settle the score. All of us. And there's all kinds of injustice going on in our lives. And you know, we can if we want to, right? Because we all have weapons. I mean, we may not have literally, literal knives to kill people, but we use our words, don't we? We use our words. And my friends, do you know of someone who has a very sharp tongue? Yeah? Don't raise your hand lest you might get hurt later. The, the, the words that come out of their mouth... For some reason, they stay with you. They hurt so much, even though they brush it off, even though they explain it, even though, although I didn't really mean that, but boy, they cause so much pain. And, you know, the person of flesh spews words that hurt, words of malice, words that cut to the heart, even though they feel justified doing so. But the person who's led by the Spirit, exercises self-control. In heated moments, even though they can, they choose not to. They choose to walk away. They choose to back off the situation and they entrust the situation to the Lord. And they allow the Spirit of God to cool them off. Came across the story of Abraham's secretary of war, Edwin Stanton. 
Edwin Stanton was enraged by one of his army officers who had falsely accused him. Stanton complained to Lincoln, who suggested that Stanton should write the officer a sharp letter. Stanton gladly did so and showed that strongly worded letter to the president. Lincoln asked him, so what are you going to do with this letter now? Surprised, Stanton replied, I, I am going to send it to him. Lincoln shook his head and said, oh, you don't want to send that letter, he said. Put it in the fire over there and burn it. Lincoln went on to say, you know, that's what I do. When I have written letters in anger and in bitterness, even letters I have written to you. What you have written is a good letter, and you had a good time writing it. And I'm sure you feel much better now. But go ahead, burn it. Then write another letter with less sharp edges. There's a wise man, a man who's led by the Spirit. See, a person led by the Spirit leaves judgment to God. Why? Because he believes God is sovereign. If God is not sovereign, <laughs> if God is not in control, then we better take things into our own hands. Then we better see to it that everything is fair and just. And we better rely on our own judgment and our own strength and our own wisdom to make everything right. We better go and avenge everything and settle account. We better give people what they deserve. But what does the Bible say? What does the Bible say about our Lord Jesus Christ? When they hurled their insults at Jesus, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to, to him who judges justly. I love that. Instead, he entrusted himself to God, the Father who judges justly. Listen to God's word to us through the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 12, verse 19. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. The word of God, so right, so clear, so appropriate, so eternal. May God help us. To trust, trust him. Trust that he is sovereign and let him be the ultimate judge. Amen. Lastly, a spirit-led person loves his or her enemy. Today we read actually two stories, one from um, chapter 24 and one from chapter 26. These two stories are almost exactly, exactly the same, where David found Saul in very vulnerable positions, right? One was when he was going to the bathroom, and the other one was when Saul was sleeping. David could have taken him out. He could have given Saul what he deserved, but he didn't. He did the unthinkable. He spared Saul's life, not just one time, but two times. But the question is worthy of our consideration. Why did David risk his life to go into the camp where Saul and his elite men were, were resting? Why did he have to do that? See, chapter 24, this is different. Uh, chapter 26 is different in a way with chapter 24, where chapter 24, it was Saul who appeared before David in the cave. But here in chapter 26, it was David who intentionally went into the camp, risking his life for what? That's a good question. Was it to prove that he could have killed Saul, but he did not? Possibly 
but very unlikely. Why? Because he had already done that in chapter 24, because he had already proven that earlier. He did not need to risk his life to prove the same point. Could it be that David did that in chapter 26 because he has something in mind? And it seemed to me that David was seeking an opportunity, a chance to communicate to King Saul something on his heart. He wanted to offload something to King Saul. And we find this out from his words, his last words, last sentences, that, a sentence that he said to King Saul. And the Bible tells us that for in a few chapters later, King Saul would die. Look at this. As surely as I value your, value your life today, so may the Lord value my life. In a way, David was equating his care for Saul with God's care for him. Do you see that? Which means David did care about Saul. David was not treating Saul as his enemy. The ESV translation uses the word precious, precious in my sight. You are precious in my sight. David is saying to Saul, you are important to me. Your life matters to me. You are precious to me. David was communicating love and care for Saul. And he risked his life to make this point. In spite of what Saul had done to him, he wanted Saul to know that he was still important to him, that he was still precious to him, and that he, David, still loved him. Now, did Saul get that? Did that do something to the heart of Saul? We don't know. Only God knows. But commentators tell us that Saul's words here in verse 25 to David, here are the most tender words that we have heard from Saul to David. Saul said to David, Blessed be you, my son David, you will do many things and will succeed in them. See, to Saul, this son of, Dave, son of Jesse has become David, my son. Did Saul change? Only God knows. But one thing is for certain. David still loved Saul, which is the love of Christ. It's a choice that we have to make when we are led by the Spirit to love our enemies. 1 Peter 3, 9. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. That's the ways of the gospel. That is the way of Jesus Christ. Is there someone in your life that you can bless today? Yes, they've hurt you. They have offended you. But you choose to show them God's love. Is there someone I hope you would do that. Why? Why? Because that's what God has done for all of us. And because of Jesus' death on the cross for us, now the Holy Spirit lives within us. And may all of us be led by that Spirit, the Spirit of God. Amen? Let's pray. Lord Jesus What we talked about today is so hard to do. In fact, it seems impossible. But Lord, that's why we need you. That's why we need your Holy Spirit to work in us, to help us to do what we cannot do for ourselves. Help us, Lord, to not take shortcuts, but to wait for your kingdom. To trust not in our own strength, but to trust in your sovereignty. 
and to love those who have offended us. Help us to do that. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. sing doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him.
And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. May God bless you. Have a wonderful week.